Amen. Hallelujah. All right. I know the children should be dismissed. They're already gone in their Shabbat school. Uh, big thanks to Fernando and David for their messages last week. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. And again, I mentioned that today it's a little different. We're having testimonies. Janet shared what, uh, what she shared at the conference. Someone else had an assignment at the conference, too. And I, we thought about it this week, and I said I, I heard about the concept of this message, and it really, you know, it was really a good concept. In fact, I wanted to use it, but instead of me using it, I'm going to invite the new president of the YMJA, Ari Foreman, to come and share a message that he gave at the YMJA. Thank you. All right, so this is a message I gave at the YMJA, so if you already heard it, sorry. I added a bit to it, though, so. The, the title of my message is, What is Love and What is Hate? Can we get the light down a bit here? All right. Do you love this man? This is Yahya Sinwar. He's the head of Hamas within Gaza. In 2004, he was a prisoner in Israel. He was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And immediately at Soroka Medical Center, Israeli surgeons removed the tumor, which they say would have burst within a matter of days. The Israeli doctors saved his life. And he was exchanged in a prisoner swap in 2011, one of 1,027 terrorists traded for Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier kidnapped to Gaza. And he's credited with the planning, organization, logistics of the October 7th attacks, which killed over 1,000 Israelis last year. So do you love him? Do you hate him? Hate, hate I hear. OK. <laughs> this is. Uh, so the last guy I showed you, he's the ground guy. He's the guy in the trenches of Gaza. Uh, the last guy, he's, he's in the tunnels, moving and shaking for Hamas. This guy is a different story. He's the political leader of Hamas. He, Ismail Haniya, he's the political head. He runs Hamas from 1,000 miles away in Doha, Qatar, where he enjoys the lavish, luxurious life of five-star resorts. And uh, I tried to figure out what, what watch he's wearing. It's probably a Rolex. Um, uh, tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Obviously, all that money was donated to help Gazans, but instead it's in his bank account. He hasn't been in Gaza for years. So do you love him or do you hate him? OK. We'll come back to that later. Now we'll talk a bit about the story of Jonah. Jonah is not only an incredible biblical story, but also a very philosophical book. We all know the story of Jonah. You know, God calls him to preach to Nineveh, uh, but instead he runs away and spends three days in a fish. Finally, he goes to Nineveh and preaches, and the people of Nineveh repent. And until this past month, I had a very childish view of the prophet Jonah. It's one of the stories you hear as a kid, so sometimes it's told in a very silly way, and, you know, running away from God. God comes up with kind of a funny way to give him a second chance, a fish. But recently, I started to think about what it was actually like for this ancient Jewish prophet to be so told to save the Assyrian city of Nineveh. So Nineveh was a real city. It was the capital of Assyria. It was a real place. Now it's in Mosul, Iraq. And back then, the Assyrian Empire was the most savage, brutal, disgustingly sinful empire of its day. One of the worst, most savage empires in history, actually. The Assyrians were known for their extreme brutality, using fear to control their empire. They often carried out mass executions. They flayed people alive, which means they carved out your skin while you were alive. They impaled captives like a chicken skewer. They destroyed cities, forcibly moved the captives to countries, to other countries, so that they'd be easier to submit. They pillaged towns, stole the women as slaves, 
Assyrian kings, act, kings actually bragged about these cruel acts uh, in their art and writings and making sure everybody knew how ruthless their tactics were. And if they had iPhones, you better believe they'd be vlogging it in real time on social media. So imagine Hamas being the largest empire on the planet. So now we get to understand that the prophet Jonah was no dummy. He was well aware of who the Assyrians were, and no wonder he had absolutely no intention of going to Nineveh and calling them to God. I wouldn't have either. So we know the story. He goes to Nineveh, they repent, but let's focus on the end of the story. Jonah goes out by himself near the city. This is after he preaches to them. And after they've repented, he's exhausted, the sun is burning on his skin, and he's furious that the people actually repented. He so wanted Nineveh to be destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah. He wanted destruction, and the destruction that they 10,000% deserved. And no doubt in my mind, the Assyrians deserved for the capital city to be completely destroyed. They were the most evil people on the planet. So Jonah goes off on his own, angry, sunburnt, and it says in Jonah 4, 6, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. It's a very funny part of the scripture. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I was dead. Jonah is furious that God just forgave them. These guys who had murdered so many innocent women, children, brutally murdered hundreds of thousands of people, living in sin, debaucherous lifestyles, worshiping other gods in disgusting ways, and just like that, God forgives them, and they never got the punishment that they deserved. Life was probably pretty normal for them after that. Other than changing their lifestyles, there were no consequences, no fire from heaven. We'll come back to the story, but this brings me to the first point. The Ninevites did not deserve forgiveness at all. Our biggest enemies in the world do not deserve forgiveness. Jonah knew that. It was true. They deserved judgment, and God was planning to judge them, to destroy them completely unless, they, unless he went. And Nineveh was about to be annihilated. And, Jonah, and God asked Jonah this very interesting question, really a philosophical question. Is it right to be angry about the plant? Is it right for you to be mad that I destroyed the plant that was giving you shelter? Jonah was furious. He said, it's right for me to be angry, and I'm so angry I wish I was dead. He hated the Ninevites for good reason. He hated that God had taken away his only relief from this situation, this one plant that was protecting him from the sun. What did Yeshua say about wrath, and what did he say about hatred? In Matthew 5, Yeshua reminded the people of the laws that are in the Torah. He said, you've heard it was said. And then he tells them a specific law, like you've heard it was said, do not commit adultery. And then he says, but I'm telling you, if you even look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. And we've heard that before. And he says, you've heard it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So he's just reminding them of the Ten Commandments. But then he says... But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And Raka is an Aramaic uh, word that means it, it's a fool that you're disgusted by. Someone whose name just evokes hatred and disgust from your heart. And John, the disciple, echoes this message uh, in first, his first letter, 1 John 3.15, where he says, Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So we've heard these things before, but let's hold on a second, because that sounds unfair. Ted Bundy is a serial killer, killed 30 people, and I've probably hated 30 people in my life, and I'm not the same as Ted Bundy. 
So let's just think about this for a second. What does he mean? What does Yeshua mean? And what does John mean when they, when they say these things? Why in the world would hating somebody put you in the exact same category as a serial killer? All right. I, got, I have a little prop here. All right. When I was about 12 years old, I was at the Max convenience store at Bathurst and Steel's with Alex. And uh, I had, uh oh, you already know what's coming. I had absolutely no money, but I loved Kit Kats, still my favorite chocolate bar. And so I really wanted the chocolate bar, and I started getting some intrusive thoughts in the store. Why don't I just take the chocolate bar? I didn't have any money. The owner's not going to care if he loses two bucks. And you justify it, but you know what I did? I didn't take it. But you know why I didn't steal the Kit Kat? It was not because stealing is wrong. It's not because Yeshua said whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. That wasn't floating in my head. I didn't steal it not because it's wrong to steal. It was simply because if I got caught... My dad had this paddle at home, and there was a 100% chance that if I got caught stealing that Kit Kat, my dad would have taken this paddle, read some scripture to me, and whipped me. <laughs> so that's your MJA president keeping me in check. And so I'll return to this story about the Kit Kat, but one more story, something I completely made up uh, probably earlier this year or something. And uh, it's, about a, it's a story made up. I want to write a, a short story about it. Maybe Disney will pick it up if they get some believing producers. <laughs> the story is about a boy named Liam. And I had him AI generated. If, uh, so Liam is a kid that absolutely resents his father. His father abandoned him as a child. He was completely absent in his entire life. This is a very real issue. Millions of kids experience this, maybe some of you. And I have many friends with the same childhood. So Liam grows up. He uh, has a hardworking single mom, absent father, and he hates his father, who is never there to help pay his bills, to see his soccer games. And Liam lives a pretty normal life. He makes pretty good money, pays his taxes to the CRA, helps support his mom now that she's a bit older. And he's not a particularly angry person. He's pretty measured, pretty reasonable, unless you mention his father, of course. You know, his heart rate goes up, clenches his fist if someone mentions his dad's name. But it's not like he goes crazy. If you mention it a few minutes later, he's back calm again. It distracts himself with something else, some work dilemma or some other plans. And so Liam's living a normal life, and he starts to get older. But one day, he has this crazy dream. It's so vivid, he actually doesn't even know if it's a dream or not. And the room changes shape. Suddenly, he's in a courtroom and standing in front of a judge whose seat is hundreds of feet high, thousands of feet long. What in the world? This is a man. There's a man sitting on the massive throne in front of him, opens up a book that's as long as the throne, and the book is completely packed with writing. There's barely any spaces in it. It's just filled with detail. And one word stands out on the book, and it says murder. And instantly, Liam realizes that he's on trial for murder. Look at him in his pajamas. <laughs> Liam hasn't heard a fly. He's paid his taxes. Maybe he has a few unpaid parking tickets. But overall, he's a pretty normal guy. But then the judge, oh, I think we got a, yeah, there we go. The judge takes Liam back to his youth. And uh, I wish George and Christina were here because their granddaughter drew this on her iPad for me at the conference, Liv Fisher, uh, Anna Fisher's daughter. So Liam is young again. And the, the judge takes Liam, puts him onto an identical planet. It's identical in every single way. Same people, same scenario, tough childhood. His father leaves, single mother. But the only difference in this planet, Liam is king. King Liam. 
Everything else is the same, except Liam can do anything he wants, any time he wants, anywhere he wants. His word is final. What he says goes. And you know, for the first few years, Liam is not bad. He's ruling pretty well, trying to be a good king. But one day, the conversation comes up about his father. The word on the street is that Liam's dad is in town. And he heard about Liam being king, and you know he needs a bit of cash and thinks maybe he can get some from his estranged son, King Liam. Imagine a father that abandoned you had the audacity to show up one day and ask for money. So Liam gets worked up. You know how he gets, gritting his teeth, fist clenched. But this is King Liam. His anger boils over, and it doesn't go down. He's enraged. He orders his guards to go and get his father, bring him to the court. Liam gets his most elite soldiers to take out his sword, and Liam orders the guard to execute his father. The head rolls a few feet away from the body. <laughs> his father is killed in a few seconds. Liam's fists start to loosen, his teeth unclench, and his heart rate goes back down. Now he's back in the courtroom, and now he knows why he's being charged with murder. Murder was in his heart the whole time, because he had hatred in his heart. In his real life, Liam never killed anyone. But the reason Liam didn't kill his father in real life wasn't because he wasn't, was because he wasn't king of the world. In real life, he had consequences. Didn't want to get caught, face public shame, go to prison, maybe get the death penalty himself. I didn't steal the Kit Kat because I'm a good person. The reason I didn't steal it was because of the risks of getting caught. It was a selfish reason, self-serving. And that day in the convenience store, I was a thief. Yeshua said that if you hate your brother, you have committed murder because God knows what you would do if you were in a situation where you could get away with anything you wanted. So we cannot judge the heart, but God will, which brings me to our second point. You do not deserve forgiveness either. Think of the thousands of times you've hated someone. Think of every sin committed in your heart that nobody's ever known about. The minute after you die, God could put you into a world where you have unlimited, unopposed, God-like power and just watch all the wickedness that was restrained in law-abiding world, and it would be let loose. That's why Yeshua and John said, if you have hate in your heart, you're a murderer. God does not only judge what we've done and what we haven't done. Proverbs 21.2 says, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And Romans says, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Yeshua the Messiah according to my gospel. That's a day when the secrets of our hearts and minds will be revealed. We cannot judge the heart, but God will. And so he holds believers to a higher standard. Those two terrorists that I showed you at the beginning, God will judge them by their actions, by their motives, and their thoughts. And you and I don't need to worry about God being thorough about their judgment because he will be as thorough and more than any one of us could be. So if we're actually going to be attempting to make ourselves like Yeshua, if we're going to drink the cup that he drank, we cannot have the same mentality about our enemies as the secular world, even secular Israel. Yeshua said in Matthew 5, you've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? So we're not supposed to just love those who love us. Yeshua said also to love your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Yahya Sinwar and Ismail Haniya. These guys are our enemies, no doubt about it. They'd crucify us if they had the chance. But what did Yeshua do to those that were crucifying him? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. He led by example up to his last breath, being tortured, beaten, nailed, hand and feet, completely naked in front of all of Jerusalem. That's the eternal God coming down in human form and still advocating for their forgiveness, pleading for their repentance. And that's true biblical love, agape love. 
So when God asked Jonah that question, is it, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? This is what it says. God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have con been concerned about the plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? God said, Jonah, you cared more about this plant being destroyed than the entire city of Nineveh. There's 120,000 people in Nineveh, and I knew them from inside their mother's wombs. I knit them together, and now they're deceived. They're blinded. They don't know what their left is from the right. Of course, God's greatest desire, his heart for them, was to be saved. Every inclination of my being, personality, even my reason and intellect, is inclined to hate those two terrorists I showed you at the beginning. They're responsible for the deaths of thousands of Israeli citizens, butchered in horrific ways. They're responsible for conflicts across the Middle East, anti-Semitism, Islamic radicalization across the globe, and yet I must love those two men. I don't like them at all. I would never hang out with them. And it's, <laughs> it's right for the Israeli government to execute justice on them by making war, but I still must love them. And both are compatible with each other. I support Israel's war 100%. And most Palestinians, I believe, are not peace-loving. I believe they're mostly radicalized, blinded by the demonic principality of Islam. But we have to love them with God's love. And how do we do that at the same time? How do we support Israel, even support its war, but also love our enemies? And I think it comes down to this question that I've been thinking about for a long time. What actually is love? What is biblical love? And I think this is the answer. This is biblical love. Um, ask yourself this about anybody on the planet who has ever lived. Ask yourself this question about those two wicked and vile terrorists, any dictator in history, the family member that abandoned you, the person that rejected you, anybody that you've hated. Would you prefer to be killed if it meant they would repent and be saved even if they were never punished? Yeshua's answer was yes to this question for everyone who has ever existed. So that's what my response must be. It's not enough for the answer to be yes for your family, for your friends, for your wives, for Israel, for those you love. Yeshua said the tax collectors, the sinners already do that. They love their families. He said the, the answer must be yes for your enemies because the answer to this was yes for him, about all of us. And there's a book for us just like there was for Liam. And we've been forgiven of so much more than we can even think. And I can call the worship team up now. When God asked Jonah if it was right for him to hate the Ninevites and hate that they were not punished but rather forgiven, it was not right. It's not right for us to be angry about who God chooses to forgive. God has forgiven us of a lot more than we can think. Every moment of bitterness and hatred, every lustful thought, every wicked motive, Thousands of them were paid by him on the cross. Millions of sins that we probably have not even thought about, all of which would have been brought up in court one day. One day we would have been judged as murderers, as adulterers, as thieves, million times over, and suffer the penalty for those evils, unless we accept the penalty paid for by the only one innocent of those crimes, the Messiah Yeshua, who died for our sins and was resurrected on the third day, and now sits as judge on his throne. So the final point is you must love and forgive your enemies because God loved and forgave you. So thank you.
today if you're getting towards the edge it's like the shepherd's rod get back I wanted Ari to share that message and, and the illustration I wanted to use and I said he may as well just use it was that two worlds because what I was going to share on today and I was meditating and thinking this week about is God's testimony about man. The scripture says if we say that we don't have sin, we call God a liar. And one of the verses that I've looked at here is in John chapter 2, where it says that when when Yeshua was in Jerusalem during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he did. <clears throat> but this is what caught my attention and is relevant. But Yeshua did not commit himself to them. Meaning, my understanding, he, he didn't entrust himself to man because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. People
people look good on the outside, but today we heard a penetrating message about what really lurks in our fallen nature, the heart of our fallen nature. There's all kinds of lists in the scriptures about it, about, you know, what proceeds out of the heart. Remember Yeshua said, what proceeds out of the heart of men, adultery, fornication, murder, envy, pride, all of those things are in our hearts of the unregenerate or the fallen nature, which is exactly why the scripture says what we need is not to try to do something from the outside, but God promised us a new heart. Lev Chadash, a new heart where there would be purity in the in our, in our heart. That's the new man living out of the new man. The old man is always lurking there. It's such a great illustration. All you need, just remove the law and you, th- you can get away with anything you want to do. What would you be doing? Think about it. No restraint. What would we be doing? It testifies of sin in our lives. That's the testimony of God, but he didn't leave it there. He also gave the testimony of eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son does not have life. So God did not leave us in this state where we're going to be judged for murder and adultery and crimes, multiple crimes of our hearts. All we needed was an opportunity and it would come out. But God delivered us through the death, as Ari said, and resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah, that through him we can be born again of God's spirit, meaning we get a new heart. It doesn't mean the old man has disappeared, but we feed the new man so the new, we live out of the new nature, keeping the old nature under the cross, under. And that's the probation of life. Who are we gonna choose? I think Daniel spoke about choices. The choice to live out and just wantonly live any way we want to live or to receive the new heart, feed the new man and live out of that pure new new man. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us, Lord. I thank you for this penetrating example, Lord. It just illustrates Yeshua knew what was in man and this illustration shows What's really in us, Lord? Thank you for the new heart. Thank you for the new birth. Thank you for a new heart that you gave us, Lord, and that we can keep vigilant over that new heart. I ask you to encourage each and every one of us not to neglect the new man, the new heart, the new spiritual nature that it's created in the image of Yeshua and that we would crucify and keep under the old man. And if you're here today and you've never received Yeshua as your Messiah, I think the example here is pretty potent. (laughs) What's in our heart is not pretty. Yeshua promised a new heart and we need to make a choice. What do we want in life? Lord, I pray for each and every one here to choose Yeshua. And if you've never received Yeshua, I want to ask you to call upon his name right now. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, Yeshua, shall be saved. You shall experience a new birth if you're sincere and you want it. It's for everyone. It's first for the Jewish people but it's also for every nation in the world. Just call on his name, Yeshua, come into my life 
cleanse my heart. Give me a new heart. I want to turn from my sin. Just say that. I want to turn from my sin. And I want to turn to you, Lord Yeshua. I receive you. I receive you in my heart. I receive you in my life. I want a new heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You can just whisper it. A whisper is enough. Lord, I want a new heart. I turn from my sin. And I receive Yeshua. Hallelujah. Now, if you just said that prayer for the first time, I want to pray for you. Just raise your hand so I can see that you prayed that prayer. Anyone here today, for the first time, pray that prayer to receive Yeshua. Father, I just ask that you would move upon each and every one in Yeshua's name, Lord God. Thank you, God. And of course, uh, there was quite an emphasis on forgiveness here today. So we need to think about if there's any resentment in our lives, any bitterness, unforgiveness. We want to make sure it doesn't turn into murder. Amen? Let's be free from it. Be free from it in Yeshua's name. Just think of that person. Lord, forgive him or her for they knew not what they were doing. That was the basis that Yeshua forgave the ones crucifying him. They don't deserve it, but neither do we. So take a moment. If it's in your heart, get it out of your heart. Forgive them. Whether it's through neglect someone harmed you or through abuse. Some of us have an anger toward God that is like Jonah. It's never a good idea. And you should just say, Father, forgive me, for I knew, I knew not what I was doing when I blamed you. <laughs> Husband, wife, mother, father, child, brother, sister, employer, maybe someone, a spiritual leader at some point. Hope it's not me. If it is, please forgive me. Hope it's not. Lord, I just pray, cause your forgiveness to flow in our lives. Lift it out of our hearts. We release forgiveness. We release those who have harmed us. Hold them innocent, Lord. Though they're guilty, hold them innocent, Lord. I forgive them. I forgive. Just put the name. I forgive him or her. In Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.